Hello and welcome to episode four of Fire Walk with us. I'm Paul. Dave. And Justin. So this episode we watched Rest in Pain. All right, so the episode starts off with Dale Cooper waking up and sharing breakfast with Audrey Horn. He realizes that she slipped the note under his hotel room door that referred to One-Eyed Jacks. Uh, Cooper then discusses his dream with Sheriff Harry S. Truman and Lucy, uh, believing that it could be a coded solution to the murder. Uh, Cooper's colleague Albert Rosenfield wishes to conduct further post-mortem on Laura's body, uh, but it's uh, released for the funeral that day. An argument grows more heated. Uh, Truman ends up punching Rosenfield <laughs> after he tells him to resume whittling. Great. Yes. Uh, later in the episode, Rosenfield will share what he's found out. Laura had been bound when she was killed, was addicted to cocaine, and had uh, some kind of bite mark or something on her. And we found, and they found an unidentified plastic shard in her stomach with the letter J on it. Leland Palmer uh, is at home and is vis visited by his niece, Madeline Ferguson, who is also played by the same actress that plays Laura Palmer. Mm. Uh, Ferguson is identical to Laura, except she has black hair. Cooper and Truman question Leo Johnson about Laura's death, believing he could be lying when he denies knowing her. They go to the funeral. Leland Palmer ends up sobbing on the casket as it goes down into the ground, and then it starts doing this weird... Yeah. Ra uh, um, raising and lowering thing. I thought they were going to end up burying him in there. <laughs> no, they weren't going to bury a man alive. Um, that night, Cooper Truman, Deputy Hawk, and Ed Hurley meet at the Double R Diner. They tell him that Truman suspects somebody is smuggling cocaine into town, and they've been working on this uh, undercover. We also get to meet the Bookhouse Boys that tell us that there is something evil in the woods around Twin Peaks. And finally... Oh, actually, we also meet Jacques' brother, Bernard, um, who has the worst accent ever. Yeah. I think it's supposed to be French-Canadian, but it's really, really not. It's... I can't even place it. It's just someone trying to do an accent, but not understanding what an accent is. Yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. Anyway, uh, elsewhere, Jacques realizes his brother is in trouble and calls Leo for help. Uh, he, Leo leaves the house... Shelley hides a gun in a secret drawer. Meanwhile, Josie Packard tells Truman that her sister-in-law, Catherine Martell, is scheming to take over the mill. Packard knows there are two account books, one fake and one real, but cannot find the real one. So that's mm. basically what happened in episode three. So what did you guys learn in episode three about Twin Peaks? Mm, I think out of the couple particular points that you've run through... There's secret compartments and doors within the house that Audrey and her family live in. Yes, they live in the Great Northern Hotel. And there are secret compartments yes, that Audrey knows about. there is a secret about, passageway. That Audrey knows about and uses to spy, spy on, yeah. on Dr. Jacoby, Jacoby yeah. and yeah. her brother. Yes. Where, <clears throat> not too particularly sure, but... It seems like a particular point to keep in mind for the future. Yes, you'll also notice there was a secret compartment in um, the Martell's house where um, Catherine was keeping the books and everything. Oh, yes. That so that's going to be a major theme yes, yes. in this series. There's a lot of just random hidden secret areas or places yeah. that... That's going to come up a lot. Okay, yeah. fair enough. I'm still kind of confused about why Audrey somehow has the hots for Dale Cooper, but um, I still don't see that working out. Yeah. Well, no. No, it's not going to. No. Um, we do learn a couple of other important things that I didn't mention in my plot synopsis. We learn that... Um, I'm blanking on her name now. Um, owner of the diner. Oh. Uh, Shelly. Um, yes. The other... Shit. She's with Ed. Yes. Dating and whatnot. Name escapes me, though, for her. Oh, well. Uh, the owner of the Devil R Diner has a husband named Hank who's going to be getting out of jail soon on parole. Yes. Yes. All right. So that is obviously going to be... That is going to play a role. Somewhere. That's going to be important coming up. Yeah. We also uh, do find out that we can assume, at least, that the powder they found in Laura's diary was cocaine because we know she was addicted to cocaine. Hmm. So does that affect who you think the killer might be? Knowing, no. No? 
No, I don't think so, no. Okay, so why don't we just move right into that, actually, right away. Who do you think the killer is right now? Uh, so, who wants to start? Mm. After this episode. No, I think I'll leave it for Justin to start with. Okay. Uh, I'm still pointing my finger at Catherine for some reason. Okay. Like, uh... There's something between her and... Is that, uh... Who's the guy that she's with sometimes? Ben Horn? Is that, um... Audrey's father. Yeah, Audrey's father. Audrey's father is also a suspicious one, but... I still want to say Catherine's very, um, scheming. Okay. So you think she's probably the killer? Maybe. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Um, David, who would your, your chief suspect be right now? As it sort of sits, I still have Bob on my list. Okay. Because he still, I think, is an important character who hasn't yet been revealed. Yes. But aside from that, he's not so much on my list for actually doing the deed, but concerns for Leo, just for what he supposedly does and the concerns and issues that can supposedly relate him to the cause of the murder. You can always get him charged with something because he is obviously a criminal in some yeah. regard. We he know needs he needs to be at, charged with something. At the very least, we know he's a drug dealer. Mm. Yes. Um, other than that, there was some relation to Dr. Jacoby, I believe, in this episode. Yes. That... There were a couple of points where you tried to throw you off a little bit of him, but I'm still kind of sticking a pin that he possibly has some relation to the murder for her. Okay. Just with him being a pa her patient at one particular point, him having the necklace, uh, that sort of thing, and the fact mm. that he secretly went to her grave afterwards, supposedly from telling Cooper for private emotional reasons but there's always the other side of the coin in that sort of regard yes uh so it is definitely suspicious that he went by himself and he didn't attend the funeral mm. um the, the bookhouse boys at one point mentioned that there is an evil in the woods mm. what do you think that might be do you think it's, it's just superstition or do you think there's something there knowing the show there's probably something it's something Okay. Any ideas on what it might be? No. I know idea. we jokingly said that she was killed by a vampire, although you do get more evidence supporting that in this episode, kind of. Uh, <laughs> probably animals in the forest. I don't know. Okay. So you mentioned that Bob was a prime suspect for you. Have you decided if you think Bob's a real person, or do you think he's still just like a hallucination? There hasn't been any sort of information within the show to sort of confirm that he's an actual person. So it's still kind of sitting up in the air. But the simple fact that something twinges within my head that he comes up on screen or that any information comes up about him, it just leaves a pin that I need to keep an eye on this because he most likely has some relation to all this. Yeah, he also has a very creepy look. Yeah, that yeah. also helps. That, like, long, stringy gray hair and everything. It's, it's really great. And that mm. stare. Yeah, he has a really creepy stare. Yeah. The, um, other particular thing. One particular line that came out of Bobby, surprisingly enough, was decided to raise his voice during the funeral, yes. saying that everyone was the cause of her supposed death. And that's an interesting kind of point to sort of keep and keep track of, where there may not be one single murderer within the case of it. It might be sort of a downward spiral of multiple people causing the incident to happen, possibly. Or maybe there was something that was actually bound to happen with her that nobody did anything about, mm. or I don't know. It's yeah. hard to really say what is going on per so se, yeah. at this point. They've, they've done something really interesting with Laura and they've set up very much uh, two different kind of personalities that you kind of follow with her. So on one hand, 
we see um, somebody who was like, um, I think she was a cheerleader. Yeah. She organized a Meal on Wheels program and all this really good stuff. And she also and, basically tutored English to... Yeah, the, and yes. she helped with uh, Audrey's brother. She did a whole bunch of really good stuff. And on the other hand, we found out know, all of this horrible stuff, like she's a coke addict and all sorts of other stuff. Mm. We'll find out more about that later, obviously. Mm. And that she has worked at One-Eyed Jacks or something? Maybe. Maybe. We don't know for sure at this point. Yeah, it's just kind of... But it's it's definitely insinuated. Mm. Yeah. So, okay, I guess my question would be, are you... How do you feel about Laura as a victim? Because the show kind of... Um, the show kind of has to work where you sympathize... Obviously, you sympathize with, with her because she was killed, but um, do you do you have like a connection to Laura, or is she just a corpse that they're investigating to you? She kind of the, is a bit more of the object that everyone is trying to decipher and discover the information about a bit more than a, than a person, since when we first do meet her she is essentially a corpse and we only hear stories and bits of information about yeah. her. Yeah, for the most part, um, you get to know just like what is, uh, what she has done to the whole community of Twin Peaks for the most part and, you know, yeah. the role and she had. And it's not so much of a point of really sympathizing with but, her herself but everyone that she's supposedly connected to, to certain respects. Yeah, yeah. and apparently everyone just knows her. Yeah, well, it is a small town, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, right, exactly. Sure. I mean, she was very active in the community, it seemed, and mm -hmm. um, apparently active in other stuff as well, for some reason. Yes. Um, so, my next question would be, do you think um, a flashback to show you more of Laura before she was killed would help? Or would that be just too much of a distraction and not enough to do with the case itself? I think if they were going to be showing something like that, it would most likely bring up points for other specific people than more specifically Laura. I'm sure some particular points would be good to bring up for Laura to sort of assist with case sort of respects, but mostly on the end of things that would most likely be the other characters that you actually see interact within the case in the show that would most likely help through a f flashback sort of respect. I would probably have to agree with that. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, I believe it was this episode where Bobby has a discussion with her name escapes me but she's with Leo but is seeing Bobby. Uh, no, Shelly. Shelly. Where she is talking with Bobby at Leo's place about what's going on, and I believe she shows Bobby the shirt, the, the blood stain and whatnot. That's next episode. That just happened. Ah, uh, okay. Save that point for later then. <laughs> Indeed. We'll yeah. bring it up then. <laughs> okay, so I have one last uh, important question about the episode. Last episode, we ended on quite a cliffhanger. With Cooper saying he knew who, he knew Laura, the, killer. who, uh, he knew who the, the killer was. How did you feel about the resolution to that cliffhanger in this episode? It was kind of being a troll. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the show is definitely like, here's a huge cliffhanger that this obviously one... they can't tell you who the killer is. Yes, it's basically so, man, I hope I watch the episode next week so I can find out who the killer is. Ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> yeah, but they got you to watch the next one, right? <laughs> So, did you feel like it was a cop-out to just be like, well, I, I had this dream and... Well, I mean... I'm not sure. It served a purpose, I think. I suppose, on the one end, you probably lose some viewership for being like, oh, they're going to suppose the answer. they will get some resolution to it. And it's like, oh, they don't do it. They lied to me. Break this show! <laughs> well, they'd probably lose viewership if they actually said anything. Well, then, then the show would be over. <laughs> yes, exactly. But then... <laughs> I guess it's just also a case that it's kind of a typical sort of ploy, and for what the age range I think this show is kind of targeted toward, they can decently understand that it's going to continue on, and the nugget of supposedly it will get resolved is just a little bit 
of a nugget aside from everything else that the show's already kind of done to keep everyone coming back to see it. Okay, so um, as a follow-up to that, what age group do you think they are targeting? Because the show does play kind of weird. Like, it plays very, like, almost like a soap opera in parts, and other parts it is like a murder mystery. So it is kind of this weird balancing thing. I'd say just a little bit past tween into younger adult sort of age. So like 18 to 30 kind of thing? Round into that area, okay. yeah. Justin, do you have any thoughts? Anywhere between like 15 and 30 or 40. Anywhere in that range would probably work for this um, for this show. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so at the very end of the episode, right before Leland's dance, mm-hmm. uh, Cooper has a conversation with Deputy Hawk about souls. Mm-hmm. Right. Souls. Did you notice any known anything about this? Um, Sadly, it is vague. Yeah. Okay. Don't so we really, have any particular notes. Didn't really on get that. it quite down because of how obscure it was. Yeah. So Hawk says a line that you might want to keep in mind, and he says, "I don't remember the exact word, like the line uh, verbatim, but the ju- the gist of the idea is he believes in many souls, including a dream soul, and that wanders to the, the land of the dead." Mm, okay. So we might want to lock that one in your brain for a while. You need to go blech. Because that could... I'm not going to say for sure it's going to be important, but it might be. Because they do spend a fair bit of time talking about souls. Hmm. Oh, yeah, so whatever the hell happened with, um... What, what the hell is that red room? We don't know. Well, uh, all we know is that he went there in a dream. Yes, mm-hmm. indeed. And that sometimes her arms bend back. And we get a... Uh, we find out what that means in this episode, possibly. Ah, potentially. Yes. Because we found out that Laura was bound when she was killed. Mm. Or shortly before. Yeah. Uh, we end the episode with a shot of a traffic light. Yeah, yes. Yes, more traffic lights in this episode. It definitely so, were. Um, have either of you figured out what the traffic light might be about? No. No. <laughs> traffic okay. light. It's it's um, gonna be interesting. I was gonna note that hey, it changed from like yellow to red, and whatever. I I still don't know. So, what did you think of this episode overall? Let's start with David. On the whole, I think it's fairly decent for moving things along, getting the couple main points of everything together. <clears throat> I can't say that there's anything particularly wrong with it, and despite the fact that possibly a couple of things flew over my head. It seems that it's covered most of the points and tried to point some people in certain directions for everything. Okay, Justin? It was definitely worth it to see uh, one guy, or see Harry Truman punch him in the face. He yeah. punches Albert, yeah. That's a pretty great moment. Yes. And then he tried to basically, uh, what was it, sue him for it? But well, he, um, he couldn't get that... Uh, Signed by he would, he definitely w- seemed like he was gonna want to press charges or something. Oh yeah, he definitely did. <laughs> <laughs> Which um, and then and then he's like, no, I'm not gonna sign this. Yeah, Cooper just refuses to help him out, <laughs> which is pretty great. <laughs> um, Understandable. Do you either of you have anything left to add? Alrighty, so that's going to be episode four of Firewalk with us. I'm Paul. Dave. Justin.